Aloha, Shervin here, and welcome to the waking hour. This is our moment in time to wake the fake up from the illusions that are holding us back from living in our full power. As Alvin Toffler said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot unlearn the many lies that they have been conditioned to believe and seek out the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned to reject. I invite you all on a journey of self-exploration where together we unlock the keys to living the best life ever. All right, there it is. Wake the fake up. This has been a long time coming. I've been working on this with my team for years almost, it seems like. And you might know me from Instagram and other social media and Symbiotica being the founder, but this is the first time we finally take all that media, all that energy, all that frequency and go off of that social media platform onto our own. And this is Wake the Fake Up. The name, what it means to me, is basically removing the veil of illusion. That's basically my doctrine. My self-proclaimed doctrine is always removing illusions. Today is the best day ever. I'm super stoked. We're starting off the first episode of Wake the Fake Up with my brother, someone I really respect, someone that I work with, someone that we're building so much energy and vibrations with. Mr. Nija Houston, welcome to the show, brother. Yes, thank you. It's an honor. First episode. I'm hyped. Yeah, right? Let's go. It's, <laughs> it's like the fire is lit and it's really, you know, no pressure, but it's all on you, man. If, if everything topples, it's because of you. Yeah, I think I'll be able to handle it. <laughs> I think I'm used to some pressure. I'll be good. <laughs> yeah, and that's something we're going to get into on the show is pressure. You know, pressure is what we're all dealing with every single day. This whole stress load, the entire po political scene is just getting really absurd, kind of like a circus. And so that's something that I really want to drop in with you. We'll, we'll get there shortly, but let me just give a little backstory. I've always known who Nija was for the most part. I grew up in Southern California, La Jolla in particular. I surfed and skated my whole life. I, I do come from a Persian background, but I was completely born um, as an American kid. And I was like, you know, in the surf scene, in the skate scene. So I grew up skateboarding and, and doing all the tricks and all that stuff. By the time I was in high school, I kind of moved out of that and into, you know, some of the main sports. It's really, really common theme for a lot of um, a lot of people my age at that time. About 10 years later, I started hearing about Nija. I saw you on ESPN. I think that's the first place I caught wind of you. And you were like, you you were like this little guy with this dreadlocks all the way down to your feet. I was probably 25 at the time, yeah. 24 at the time. It was really trippy seeing that. And to be connected to you later in life, you know, 10, 12 years later by a by an old friend of mine was really a trip and it's it's an honor to have connected with you. I just want to lay that out. You're you're a good guy. <laughs> Hell yeah, you too, bro. You yeah. too. So tell me a little bit about your story. Most of my listeners might not know who you are. You are world number one in skateboarding, whatever that means. We can get it. I want to break that down. But you are, you know, you're kind of leading the way in terms of consistency, in terms of tricks, in terms of going big, in terms of contests. All of that, you have a ton of momentum behind you. You got a great family. I've met most of them. I'm now part of your tribe, you know, really coming in and bringing a lot of my influence to your reality in terms of health, in terms of, you know, psychology, spirituality, all of that stuff. Tell me a little bit about your background because I know you grew up, you know, you know, quasi vegan in the Rasta lifestyle. Um, I think most of the people that don't know you, they're going to find this part of your intro very, very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, definitely an interesting upbringing. Very, very humble, very humble upbringing. Um, my family was, we were always on the move, always like living on some island. I think when I was like two or three years old, I, we were living in Fiji for a couple years and just, just always really humble lifestyle. You, if any of you guys know what the Rasta lifestyle is like, it's, that's, that's what it is. You know, it's really humble living, healthy living, um, all about positivity and just kind of going about life in a, in a very simple, clean way. Like minimalistic, yes, right? Where yes. you're not like, you're not slaves to the material world. You're not slaves to things and items. Yeah. Yeah. You're living off the land and just the culture is just so grounded. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, mainly just like 
Rasta people and just growing up like that, it's uh, they're just not materialistic people at all. You know, they only they only need what is necessary. You know, they don't need nice clothes. They don't need fancy stuff and fancy cars and stuff like that. And um, it's interesting because nowadays, like I I still see some of that part in myself. You know, I mean, I'll I'll I get tons of stuff sent to me all the time every week from people i'll literally wear the same hoodie for like 30 days straight and like that's just me that's just how i am that's how i was raised and that's also like how we are as skateboarders we're just simple people casual people um but yeah being raised that way i'm i'm really thankful for it to be honest it was a really healthy healthy way of living um i was i was born in davis california bounced around a little bit lived in fiji for a couple years what years were you in fiji um, I believe I believe when I was two years old, two okay. two and three. Okay, and then I think we moved back to Davis when I was like three, four. Interesting. So Davis, if you don't know, is in Northern California. It's a little bit east of Lake Tahoe, in between San Francisco and Lake Tahoe, close to Sacramento, and it's a small college town, right? You see Col- Davis? Yeah, college town. Really, uh, really like safe, just small town, and uh, it's uh, it was it was a cool place to grow up. Not gonna lie, it was cool. And uh, started skating when I was when I was four years old. My dad got me my first board, and I started getting into it. Um, I would just like push around on my knees at first, and I would like even before that, I would have these random. There's actually a photo of it in my house. I would have these random items, not even toys, and I would just be pushing. I'd stack them on my skateboard because I'm like mad OCD. And I would just stack them in a certain way, and I'd just be pushing my board around on the sidewalk. <laughs> that's <laughs> interesting. So that's what happened before I started skating. Yeah. And then um, when I was like four or five years old, I actually started getting up, pushing around. Um, first board was Tony Hawk board, of course. Okay, so it was like it wasn't the standard trick board; it was that U-shaped board that Tony Hawk, or was um, it like no, no? It was a pretty standard board, pretty standard, standard board? street okay. board. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, and uh, just grew up skating with uh, with my brothers. I got three brothers and one sister. I'm in the middle. We're all two years apart. Um, was so, everybody skating? Yeah, basically okay. everyone. I mean, obviously the uh, the younger ones were still pretty small, but uh, I grew up skating with my two older brothers. So it was it was sick to be able to have like family to always skate with because we weren't people that like I didn't have a lot of friends growing up and stuff. Like our family was just super close. That was that was what we had. That was who we hung out with and spent our time with. Which so- which was probably super powerful because I remember growing up skating and skating to the, for the most part at that age was really a social thing. Definitely. You know, it's like you're with your brothers, you know, you're with your sisters, you're with your friends. It's like a group of you guys go go out together. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Growing up like having my brothers to skate with was good and also like my older brother is two years older than me. He was really good too. Like growing up, he was was could do tricks that I couldn't even do for a while. So I was always trying to keep up with him and that made me progress faster because I'm naturally a really competitive person. So I was like, oh, he can do that. Like I need to learn this too, you know? Yeah, that's a, an amazing, um, you know, litmus test almost to have. It's kind of like Seabiscuit the horse. They said that the horse can't actually go into top speed until it sees the competition in the eye. So yeah. the horse has to come next to it. That's tight. And that's, um, you know, that's part of your character. So you grew up skating with your family. At what point did you realize that, wait a second, holy shit, I'm getting good? It was fast. It was fast, man. Because started skating um, my first like little con- little kid contest series when I was six, almost seven. And... I skated that little series until for that like next year and a half. So until I was like eight years old and I won every contest. It was called Castle. It was a little contest series. They had like a division in Southern California and Northern California. I was in the NorCal and then at the end, the two um, would meet up. So it'd be SoCal kids and NorCal kids all competing for the championship. And I, I won both championships and won every single contest. Do you remember what that felt like to win? Like, can you go back to that? A little bit. I have like very slight memories of those days because I mean, it was a long time ago, but I remember, I remember after winning, not wanting to lose. Like even I'm just naturally competitive person. So even though I was so young after getting that, that taste of a victory at a young age, like I didn't want to go out there and get second. And also my dad was, was super hard on me for it too. He like, he he would have been on my ass if I got second, like or or anything but first. So, okay, so that's a interesting psychology, yeah. Right. So there's different ways what we can channel that and kind of go into that. So, number one, it's part of your human design to be competitive, 
right? It's just something that you're born with. Some people have it. Some people don't. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's just how you're wired, mm -hmm. right? I have, you know, a similar energy in terms of competition and wanting to be the best after some crazy medicine ceremonies that kind of dwindled down a little bit, but my, my fire is still there and I still want to prove to myself always that I can do better and yeah. I can always challenge myself. There's something about that. It's just part of our chemistry. Now your father, um, he was, he was pushing you. He was driving you at the same time he was teaching you and he was teaching you discipline and responsibilities and stuff like that. But yeah. do you, do you remember feeling pressure from him to have to succeed? Lots of pressure. Okay. Lots of pressure. Not just not just in the contest either. It was an everyday thing. Okay. So it was it almost was, like a militaristic yeah, type thing. Yeah. And it was it was rough, I'm not gonna lie. It yeah. was rough. And uh But he he's a Rasta background. Yeah. Right? You mm -hmm. know, he's Rasta at the core of it is peace, love, happiness, complete balance. Yeah. It's flow state. Was how, how did those two energies conflict with each other? Were they contradictory? Was there, did you ever feel there was like him being a hypocrite? Did you have that going on? I was a little confused because I was aware of the lifestyle we were living and how it's supposed to be based on around positivity and kind of not the way he treated me and my brothers a lot of the times. So I was, I was a little confused at times. I was like, hmm, this is, this is like, it feels like it's like two two separate things and it's just like it's 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 confusing and the main thing with me is it was it was unnecessary pressure because he saw from such a young age how much i love skateboarding i was literally the kid who woke up in the morning went and skated in my backyard my mom used to have to beg me to come inside to eat breakfast i would go skate all day learn new tricks all that and then get home and i would skate in my garage for hours literally by myself on your Do own accord yeah yeah no Do one pushing doing you. like doing like just a kickflip like 50 times in a row and then my mom would have to beg me to come inside and eat dinner like that would that was me like every day when i was a kid so that's why it was so confusing because it was like all right my dad like really wants me to um succeed in skateboarding obviously and he's he's taking it really seriously but why does he feel like he needs to push me to do something that he sees that i clearly want to do on my own that's so interesting so, was, was he a skateboarder himself he was back in his teenage years okay he was so maybe combination he was reliving his glory absolutely through you? okay absolutely yeah okay, because because his parents uh my grandma is like full japanese so you can imagine skateboarding back in the day and a full Japanese ground. They're like, she's what, like, no way. What, what is you, this? What are you doing with your life? Yeah, yeah. Why are you playing on this toy? Why yeah. are you not going to school or going to college and stuff? Of course. So his parents weren't supportive on it. So I, th I feel like that's one of the reasons why he wanted to get me and my brothers into it. And I appreciate his support on it so much and my whole family support on it. But it was just a little over the top. It was like, damn, this is this is a lot. That, that was like a Nirvana moment for me right now, really inter understanding exactly the experience. A lot of you know foreign cultures, they don't really understand American culture. Mm -hmm. They don't understand something like skateboarding. It, they yeah. probably look at it as a complete waste of time. Yep. You know, I come from, I'm first generation. My parents are Persian. A lot of the things that I was doing earlier, earlier when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old, they didn't understand. They're like, what is this? You should be focused on your schooling. You should be focused on education. You know, we want you to grow up to become a doctor, a lawyer, yeah. all of those things. That's just because... That's what was embedded into their mind, into their consciousness in terms of what they saw to be successful. They didn't know any of these things were possible. So your dad probably embodied that karma. He had that. And so with you guys, he's like, uh-uh, I'm not going to let that fade out. Yeah. And I'm going to let my glory pass through to you. Did he also envision this becoming some type of worldwide brand? Did he have, did you ever feel that like it was an economical thing? Thinking back on it now, it's hard to even picture what was in his head at such a, at those younger times. Like, he obviously saw my potential very fast and yep. saw that I was special. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why our relationship grew apart over the years is because he, he couldn't let go of that. And then by the time I was getting older and uh, let's say like 13, 14, 15, and I was supposed to start learning things on my own and learning how to go about life and go on trips by myself, deal with my sponsors and talk to people on my own and think of my contest runs and the tricks I want to do on my own. And he was still trying to do that and hold on to that. And it just, it just wasn't working. It just wasn't right. So, so naturally at some point that's going to fracture. 
yeah. right? Especially as you're evolving into a man, you're starting to gain your own faculties, your own awareness, and your own liberation. I mean, all, uh, everyone does that. Men, women, at some point, we become our own sovereign beings, right? Yeah. And depending on how we were raised by our parents, if it was just so concrete their way, that fr that fracture is going to be stronger yeah. versus like an ease and grace flow, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's fluid. So what age did that happen at? You said 13, 14? Yeah, I mean, around around 13 is when really like things started to kind of fall apart and stuff. Um, we moved from Davis, California to Puerto Rico when I was 11. And before that, the past three years, we my family owned their own uh, private or public indoor skate park in Woodland, 15 minutes away from where we were from. And that's where I practiced every day. That was my life. I went to the skate park every day out of the week, practiced my tricks, learned new tricks. On the weekends, my dad was my filmer. We went out street skating and filmed. And that's footage you use for your sponsors and whatnot. Why would he take you from that Dude, to Puerto Rico just, when you're in your in the growing part of your entire career? Know, he's just a confusing so, guy. So it was a, a control move. Guy. Yeah. Did it, he see threat? Of you staying there was there were you building relationships did he see more well, avenues for you to to leave him i think i think he was trying to balance out him being a big part of my skateboarding career and my manager and just my my guy for skateboarding and also trying to keep me and the rest of my siblings away from normal society away from going to normal school none of us went to normal school um in those beginning years as kids i never did at all were you homeschooled yeah homeschooled okay. i used to do like a couple hours of homework every day with my mom and then that was it okay which um, i'm kind of a fan of but that's another conversation but yeah keep going. No, no i think it's tight yeah but don't get me wrong like when i was a kid of course you want to be a normal kid you want to have friends yeah you want to yeah. have friends we really we weren't, weren't really allowed to have a lot of friends growing up especially me because he would see me even at my skate park growing up that I was talking about, like I would just be there, I would be practicing skating, having a good time. And I would be like talking to kids, you know, like just being being a normal kid, wanting to like have some friends and stuff. He would see me doing that and he would not be hyped. Wow. He'd be like, why, why aren't you taking this seriously? Why aren't you practicing? And I'm just sitting there like he wasn't, he wasn't the type of person that you could talk back to. So you couldn't really express yourself. That was my next question to you. Could yeah. you communicate with them and say, hey, look, nah. this isn't working for me. Let's, let's like, Let's readdress how we want to have this relationship. No, nah, there was, of course nah, not. There was okay. like a lot of lot of lot of control and a lot of like intimidation when it came to like expressing yourself. So when I was in situations like that, I'm just sitting there thinking like, what is happening? Why? How do you see me out here every day practicing my damn ass off, learning new tricks every day, and you see me having fun with kids and you don't think that's a good thing? Like how, how is this a thing? And it was just, I was just so confused. What do, what do you think that's done to you emotionally? Have you gone back to that and tried to look at your subconscious and looked at maybe some of your traumas? Because that is a form of trauma. This is your father, yeah, right? Yeah. And like, we don't need to go in, in, into, you know, deep, deep into your psychology. But when you're, when you have a parent who's so controlling, who is expressing through intimidation, mm -hmm. who is limiting your ability to become naturally your evolved self, that causes, you know, issues, mm -hmm. you know, and things that you need to work through. Have yeah. you have you looked at yourself and seen maybe some some resistance in your life, part of your conscious state, part of your personality that might have been influenced by that? And I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah. But this is this no, is I've, what healing's I've, all about. I've I've put a lot of thought into this too. And sometimes I even I see the way it's affected my siblings and stuff and some some hard times they've gone through even after the after the fact of the whole dad situation and I look back at myself and sometimes I I'm, I'm even thinking like should I should I be more affected by all that like am I am I like weird for not feeling like more more like that but I mean, I guess naturally I feel like I'm just a pretty like strong willed person. And I feel like that's why I was able to get through all those hard times, get through all that pressure with skating. And after I did have the option to do whatever I wanted after my parents got divorced when I was 14, 15, I still wanted to be on a skateboard. That says a lot right there. Yeah, because you didn't want to throw it away there, and there, throw it in his face. There was a small, small period of time when, uh, when I was 
started back living with my mom after I hadn't seen her for like a full year. Um, finally got divorced. I was with my mom. And I, I think there was a little bit where I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't even know if I want to skate anymore. Like this, this shit like tore apart our family. Mm. I just want to go out and have fun and be a normal kid. And I think that only lasted for like a few days or maybe a week. And then I was like, nah, like I, I need to skate. I need right. to skate. Right. So. That's, I mean, that's part of your dance in this life. Is yeah. Being on yeah. That skateboard. But I feel like when it comes down to it, it's just, it's just made me a way tougher person. Sure. In in a lot of ways, you know, yeah, because I'm not. It was it was a lot to deal with as a kid. It was a lot to deal with. But there's something called hormesis. That which does not kills you makes you stronger, right? Yep. And that can come in all forms. That can come from you know jumping in an ice cold river in Iceland. That can come from mm -hmm. sitting in an infrared sauna. That could be from fasting for two weeks. That could be from having conflict with your best friend, your your father, and going through that whole ordeal. It's all medicine, right? Yeah. And I, you know, I commend you for that. I commend that you stuck with your craft and you stuck with what you loved instead of using that because a lot of people probably might have turned away and yeah. walked away and, and that their whole karma and their whole life would have been completely different. And now yeah. look where you're at now. So you went to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico wasn't the jam. And then you bounced out. You went back and, and came with your mom, right? And then from there, shit started popping. The competition started popping. The training started popping. Your life expanded. Your mind expanded. Your heart expanded. Yeah. Tell me about that, you know, that phase of that part of your life. Yeah. I mean, those, those years from when I, when I really got my freedom, when I was like four into 14, 15 to like the few years after that, those are probably my favorite years of my whole life because I felt like I could finally be my own person. I felt like I could finally have, have homies, go out and skate and actually have fun instead of feeling like I constantly have this pressure that like I have to I have to skate a certain way or do a certain trick even though I don't want to try it or I'm too scared to try it like there was just so much of that growing up that when I had my freedom man those were those are the years me and me and the homies had so much fun throughout those times it was great this is interesting because Nyjah in, in a sense is an artist what he's doing is a craft um, what he's doing on a skateboard I don't know if you guys have seen him it's art and Rudolf Steiner, one of my mentors, talks about the philosophy of freedom. And that freedom is not, you know, just not being behind bars or being in shackles or being handcuffed. It's a mental thing. It's an emotional thing. When you're boxed in, into, you know, quarters where you naturally don't feel like you belong or you don't want to be, your inspiration dwindles, your creative sense dwindles. But when once that freedom is given to you and it opens up, it unlocks so much ability of the mind. And that's when you're sovereign. When you're sovereign, you're able to become creative and do things you never thought you were able to do before. Mm -hmm. And that's when your career kind of went off, right? Absolutely, yeah. So Absolutely. what happened? So you started entering competitions? Yeah, yeah. Um, got got some new sponsors, um, Element Skateboards. Uh, we had like, I that was my first sponsor ever when I was seven years old. And then we started having a falling out around that time because of my dad, not because of me, but because my dad wasn't doing his part on letting me starting to become my own person. And they saw that. And then so I, right after that, I got back with them, um, had a great relationship with them since then, and then got some new sponsors, skated my first um, or won my first pro contest ever at um, it was the first street league ever. It's called SLS. It's like the main like uh, like series of contests and in, in skating. And there was the first one ever in Arizona in 2010, and I won it. I won the first one. How old were you in 2010? Um, I was 15. You were 15. So you won the first street league competition in Arizona. Yeah. Now, do you remember? So you, you had to remember that one, right? Of course. Okay, yeah. What did that feel like? Just just emotionally, energetically, how far you've come. Did you just feel like you're on top of the world? Like it's like a, like king energy in I'm a not beautiful gonna, way? I'm not going to say it felt like I was on top of the world, but it felt like hard, like all the hard work and all the hard times I'd been through it finally started paying off. Because even aside from my whole dad situation, I started skating pro contests when I was 11 years old. I won the biggest amateur contest when I was 10. So then by the time I was 11, I was like, all right, it's, that, that's just like what's So it's a reality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was weird to be skating it. For everyone, it was weird. There was like, why is this 11 year old skating pro contest? But I had already won all the other ones. So it was just what was going to happen. Um, X Games, all those ones. And then throughout the next few years, I got so many damn second places. Oh my God. It this was, is this it, is probably the best thing for you. Tell me, tell, dude, okay, how many? Tell me. 
Okay, so it was if, fucked. If you okay. <laughs> second place is almost worse than fiftieth place. Okay, yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Agree. Okay, so I, I'm with you on that. Um, and it's it's pretty um subjective, right? Because with skateboarding, it's not a matter of the score of the game. It's not putting a ball between a basket or you know scoring a touchdown. You have judges, right? And yeah. judges give you scores. Yeah, and, and it's, it's and it's hard to judge. It's hard to judge. It's like you judge. you actually you give them that credit, right? Yeah. Like in order to to properly judge, you really have to know your shit and you have to be really on point and you have to be consistent, yeah. right? It's the consistency that that separates a good judge from a not, not good judge. Like if you're gonna mark someone for this, you better yeah. mark it across the board, exactly, right? Yeah. Okay. So you kept getting second pl second place, dude. So many. Wow. Literally, my first pro contest ever. I was 11 years old. It was in Australia. It was this like globe contest, and me and Sheckler were battling it out for first. Ryan Sheckler. Yes, okay, we were cool. battling it out, and I'm. It's hard to even remember exactly the way it went down, but a lot of most people, from what I heard, thought I should have won, and I'm not really the type of person that like, even nowadays, if I feel like I maybe should have won. I'm not like, oh, I should have won that. Like, though, unless it really was that like, way. So obvious. Yeah. Right. So, but like even, Mike Tyson's yeah, last fight. Yeah, but even fight. after that one, I was like, I, I was, I was an ob observant kid. You know, I saw everything that was going on. I knew skateboarding so like better than most adults. I was, I was so in tune with with every trick that's been done and everything that people was doing. So, so how'd you react to that? Even so when you when you got second. Do you remember like physically and emotionally, physiologically? How did you feel? Did you feel betrayed? Were you pissed off? That one, I wasn't that mad. I was I was uh I was a little bummed because a lot of people were coming up to me like, Oh damn, you should have won. Like Yeah, of course. And I was naturally. Like, hmm, yeah, it would have been sick to win my first pro contest ever, but it's also my first one ever and I'm fucking eleven years old, so I yeah. really shouldn't be stressing. Yeah. But then throughout the next couple years, it happened so much, bro. I, I, up until the first one I won, the first street league when I was fifteen. Wow! It was probably so three like, years of that. There was probably at least like six or seven like major contests, second places that I got, and I was just like, "There's no way this is like still happening." Because a couple of them were pretty obvious that I should have won, and I feel confident saying that. So, was it fate that put you in this position? What do you think it was? Because your fire got lit because of this, right? Or did it take yeah. you? Did it take you out of it? I mean, were you kind of just like, at some point, I'm I'm sick of this. There's nothing else I can do. There's a curse on me. They, they don't like me because of my hair or whatever it was. I mean, what were you feeling? Because this is good. Because a lot of people deal with this every day. Yeah. And the reason why I want to I want to hit home on this is that. You know, a lot of people feel left out. A lot of people feel betrayed. A lot wow. of people, you know, and, and a lot of it's illusion, yeah. right? And they're just coming up with stuff. It's some kind of psychosis. And it actually paralyzes anyone from actually making any serious gains in their life or creating mm -hmm. momentum. Mm -hmm. So you're getting all these second places. At what point are you kind of like, fuck, like, like, is there anything else I can do? Or were you just, were you angry or how you? Know, you... I, I, I always knew my time was going to come. Okay. I always knew it was going to come as long as I kept so you were patient. Going. Yeah. As long as I kept going. And, um, every year I was progressing so much cause I was still so young. Yeah. And in those young years in skateboarding, like you're, you're learning new tricks, like literally every time you skate, you know, you're just progressing at such a high pace. So I, I feel like I was good at being patient with it, but a couple of the last ones that were like pretty obvious that I should have won. Um, I think the, the main one was when I was, I think I was 14 and it was the, it was one of the biggest contests ever for a hundred grand for first. Oh, wow. That's a lot of, that's a big purse for skateboarding yeah. back then. Yeah. And they started that contest when I was 12. So I skated it when I was 12, 13 and 14. Um, some people thought I should have won the one when I was 12 and this was like the most money in skateboarding at the time ever. Yep. Um, P rod won that one. Paul Rodriguez. Yeah. Got it. You were and, second place, and, and I wasn't that mad at it. Part of the reason was because Pirod won, and I he's been my favorite skater since I was a kid, and I looked up to him. And he just he's just the sickest dude. He looks so tight on the board. He does such sick sick tricks. He has the best style. Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't that mad at that one. Okay. And I was also only twelve. But then when I was fourteen, I it, the same situation happened, and I skated so good. 
it was insane. It was probably still like one of my best performances to this day because it was a jam session on, I think it was probably a 10 minute jam session on like three different sections of the course. I did good in the first couple sections and the last section is the biggest one. It was like a triple set. It's called the big section, big rail, big, big ledge going down and a triple set. Okay. And I literally did not fall once. I landed every single trick I did in those like either like five to 10 minutes. Wow. Every single trick. So it was trick. like, a, it was a flawless run. Yeah. And then I didn't win. And then you didn't win. And so I, and at what point you're like, what else could I do? I was just like, what is happening? Yeah. Like, how is this possible? Yeah. I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you turn that all around, whatever you did. I don't know. Maybe you just smiled differently at the judges or you started to smell better. Who knows? <laughs> then you started to win. And when yeah. you started to win, you started to fucking win, right? Yeah, absolutely. T tell me what you've won so far. Ah, uh, so since then, since that first street league, I've won uh twenty five street leagues. Twenty five street leagues. Yeah. Are they what are they three times a year? Yeah, on average, there's like three or four a year, and yeah. I think uh, to put it in perspective for people, I think there's been about forty total. And you've won twenty five of them. Yeah. What is that? Sixty percent? Sixty five? Something like that. Do yeah. the math on that. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And so you're dominating the sport. What else have you won? Um, let's see. I got thirteen X Games golds now. So I got to win. Um, you have you okay? Say that again. <laughs> okay, so say that because that just kind of caused a bra some brain chemistry <laughs> to falter in my head. Say that one more time. 13 golds. You have 13 golds yeah. in X Games. Yeah. That's freaking crazy. That's like Michael Phelps style, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Who has so. the most X Game golds? Um, I believe it's Sean White. Okay. And I think the main reason because of that is because he got golds in skateboarding and snowboarding. Oh, he went to Vert. That's yes, right. Okay, I forgot about that. He he's another exactly local guy. Yeah. From I think he's from Oceanside or yeah. Carlsbad or something. And he has 15. So I need to win three more, and then, <laughs> and then I got them. I'll have the most ever. Okay, I good. I that. Well, we got that. That's yeah, easy. Yeah. Okay, so I, not easy, but you're right there. Yeah. So momentum's interesting, right? You know, I always talk about momentum on a lot of my lectures and a lot of the podcasts I've been on. I always compare it to flow state. Once you go, once you start getting into a rhythm things start to come into place. And to get into that rhythm, it's not A to Z immediately or zero to 100 immediately. It's a couple of things here, here and there. Changing some ritual habits, some practice methods, the way you eat, the way you think, the way you do certain things. What is what does your life look like right now? What's the evolution of Nyjah Houston right now? Because, and, and, and before me coming on board and working with you and, you know, bringing everything that I know and head of, you know, b being your head of nutrition and all that stuff. But what, what evolved for you in terms of your lifestyle that's put you in this position to kick ass and to dominate the sport? Yeah. Yeah. As far as my life now and skateboarding and everything, it's really just like trying to, trying to keep going, trying to stay as healthy as possible because I'm, I'm only 26. But when you think about the amount of work and trauma my body's been through, compared to other people it's pretty crazy because i was jumping down like 16 stair rails when i was nine years old and 16 that, let me just jump in there 16 stair rails okay okay everyone listening i've seen all this i've been there personally i know skateboarding it's very very hectic thing to go off a of, you know the side of a stairwell you know, where there's a bar, anything can go wrong. And just the impact that his body goes through, you know, he's not landing, you know, in the sand, he's not landing in water, you're landing on a board or you're landing on cement, yeah. right? You're not landing on a grass. Yeah. So there's no give, no give, right? So you've been doing this since four years young. Just think about, you know, kind of what the body's already gone through. They, and we compare it to like LeBron James, right? He's yeah. been in the he's been in the league for 17, 18 years. All the all the wear and tear on the body. Yeah. Are you starting to feel that? Absolutely, man. I've been starting to feel it the past uh starting starting at least like a few years ago, I really started to feel it. And what I mean, what people have to understand is they see they see us skate these contests, which we land most of our tricks in because you have to be consistent in contests. And they see us in these video parts I put out for Nike or something, and they see all these these big tricks I'm doing. And you got to keep in mind that that's what we're landing. Skateboarding is 90% falling. 
So la- when you land on your board, it actually doesn't hurt because your board is absorbing the impact. But what people don't see often is all the falls before. When you're jumping down a 15 stair for an hour straight, like your legs, your ankles, and your knees get so dusted. Like it's it, it's it's insane. So so basically what Naja's saying is that you don't see basically all the treacherous downfall that comes with the sport, which is learning how to fall properly and severe, severe impact to your ankle, to your knees, to your spine, to your neck, to your wrist. I mean, everything takes on that shock force of that fall. You know, it's funny you brought this up because the first time I actually seen you fall was on a video from my fucking high school. Oh, yes. From La Jolla Jolla High School. Okay. (laughs) And and those stairs go from the main quad area down to the gymnasium. Okay. And I know those stairs because those stairs were super hectic. Yeah. I used to slide down them on my butt on the pole. <laughs> and that was like, I was always like, these stairs are crazy. Yeah. I would, I remember I was a kid. I was like, God, imagine flying off this in your rollerblades or your skateboard or something. Mm-hmm. And so when I first saw one of his videos, you know, recently within the last year, I'm seeing him eat shit on the how many stairs is that? That's got to be at least it's, 14 it's, it's or an 15. 18. That's 18. It's 18, yeah. Dude. And that that fall, the one you're talking about, that's still one of my worst falls to this day. Probably like top 10. Wow. And I got so lucky. I hit my head so hard. I don't know if, it, if I just got a hard ass head. <laughs> well, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> or or if I just hit a good spot, but I think I hit like not really the back. It was more like this like side part. Side right parietal. Here. Yeah. Dude, I hit it so hard and I somehow did not get knocked out. I didn't have a seizure. I just knocked the wind out of myself. Unbelievable. There's certain parts of the skull that can take that kind of force. But just one millimeter off or one centimeter off, and yeah. all of a sudden you have a soft spot and yeah. you're going to be having crazy, crazy concussions. And well, we all know about concussions. Go ahead. Yeah. I want to ask you, yep. do, I, do I actually have a hard head from hitting it <laughs> so much over the years? Because when I was a kid, you got to think, I stopped, I stopped wearing helmets when I was seven years old. Most kids stop wearing helmets when they're like... 12 13. it's a respect thing right it's a cultural yeah. thing you yeah. just you can't wear and it's a pretty crazy helmet. that my yeah. dad was even down for that your dad's your dad's a berserker i think it's tight it i look yeah, back on it i still think it's tight but like if yeah. i was watching my kid out there and I'm, I'm gonna have kids one day so i'm not gonna let my kid be out there seven years old jumping down these rails with no helmet i'll be like dude you're out of your mind out you're of your not mind. doing that especially at seven you know that skull is still forming it starts to harden around five six but like it's still forming yeah now your question well, I think at some point, <laughs> at some point, we really have to examine. I, I want to take you in to get an MRI almost immediately. Yeah. A friend of mine has a lab and a facility here in Orange County. Um, let's go and do a brain scan. Let's see what's going on in there so I can give you kind of, you know, I, I don't want to just postulate and just throw, yeah. throw that out there. But yes, the more you hit certain parts of your skull, the more scar tissue you start to develop, just yeah. like anywhere on your body. But that's not really a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I used to hit my head a lot as a kid because I didn't have the neck strength to be able to like, keep my head up. Yeah, I did have my dreads for some cushion, which actually probably did help. But okay. I, but I for sure got at least a few concussions as a kid, and my dad just wasn't the type of person to be like, "Oh, let's go to the hospital." So I just kept skating, wrote it out. <laughs> that's just so wild, you know. The brain is just so delicate, and you know it can hemorrhage, you can have aneurysms, you can have all these things, brain damage, all kinds of stuff. But you know what? With the technology we have today, and the the nutrition we have today, and some of the um, some of the therapies we have today, we can repair some of that stuff. All right, so you're you're sitting there, you're winning, you're kicking ass, life is becoming good. Now you're starting to become a man, and you're starting to become financially independent. Mm-hmm. Okay. What does that feel like? What did that feel like for you? I mean, I'm sure, and now you're, you, you know, your, your mom, who's the most amazing woman I've, I've, I've connected with her. She's going to be over at our house next week. I'm going to be um, connecting with her on nutrition and wellness and spirituality. You're, you're the man of the house. Yeah, You are. And like, what has that done for your soul and your character? I mean, it feels great. It feels great. Still to this day, the best part about anything is just making a living off of doing something that I love. I mean, I'm not, I'm really not the type of person that could go out there and work a normal job or do something that I'm not happy doing. Even if it was making me good money like that, that wouldn't make me happy as a person. Yeah. Your soul would be depleted. Yeah. Like to think like I, what would I be doing without skating? Because I've been so used to 
being this skateboarder, having this love for something and this passion, having this adrenaline adrenaline rush that I can that I can satisfy pretty often. So like, what would I be doing? That's so trippy. I, I think, to think I think that, to right? myself like wh- like I'm I'm definitely not sitting behind a desk. No way, absolutely. I would not. like I would join the army maybe. Interesting. Because maybe that would give me that adrenaline that I need. Because still to this day, like I need that. When I'm hurt for a couple months, I lose my mind. Okay, so I I can corroborate his story right now because he is an adrenaline junkie, and and I know that <laughs> feeling. I mean, I used to jump off some of the biggest cliffs in La Jolla. I've surfed huge waves, you know, driving fast cars, but Nigel is different in that sense and re- reminds me somewhat of how I used to be. I'm I'm not so much like that. I'm, I have adrenaline. I'm an adrenaline junkie in different ways. But whenever, you know, he's not skating, he's doing something hectic. And um, and we were just driving down to San Diego the other day and, you know, he took the car and went... <laughs> I don't know, 160 miles an hour. And let me tell you, if I'm driving behind the wheel, that's fine. But being a passenger, it's very, very uncomfortable, you son of a bitch. And um, so so this is interesting. So you have this adrenaline ru- rush that you have from skateboarding. It's keeping you fulfilled. Now you're in your dharma, which is basically your chosen life path. You're creating abundance with it. You're influencing a lot of people. You have a responsibility with that, right? Um, I can adhere to that because I'm in a similar boat and, and what I'm doing, I'm doing what I love. I have such passion for nutrition and wellness and spirituality. This is, this is my life's work. This is where I'm going to, cr- you know, I'm creating my legacy. What we're doing here will stir, is stir echoes for eternity. This is it. So being in the position that you are, what responsibility do you feel that you have on the culture of skateboarding? And keeping skateboarding in a position where it is today, and where do you see it going? Where where are you at the de- a defining legacy in the whole world of skateboarding? Yeah, yeah, I'm in an interesting position because I think it would be safe to say that aside from like Tony Hawk and stuff, I am like the like big name skateboarder out there. Like outside of skateboarding, people know my name, you know. So I guess you would say that I am the most famous skateboarder aside from. Tony Hawk, aside from some other people outside of skateboarding that have done stuff, Rob Deerdeck, um, Bam Margera, stuff like that. Because I'm still a true skateboarder. And that's what I've- Yeah, given. you haven't pivoted that's, yeah, from skateboarding yeah, even, into even, another career. Even Ryan Sheckler, he had his TV show thing. That was how he got a lot of his fame. Yep. I got mine really strictly from skateboarding. Okay. So I feel like I play a big part in showing people that there's more to skateboarding than making money there's more to skateboarding than being famous there's more to skateboarding than winning contests i feel like i play a big part in showing that and i feel like that's something i've done um what what is there what is there more to skateboarding outside of that stuff because let's get into the soul of it yeah yeah yeah, that's what i'm getting into yeah Yeah. i mean there's there's just so much more to it the people that people that don't know about skateboarding out there that even maybe heard of me they're like oh he's number one skateboarder because he's won all these contests which is true but there's so much more than that i've i've had so many video parts for sponsors and if you really know about skateboarding you might look at that and think that that plays a bigger part in me being where I'm at compared to the contest that I've won. And that's street skateboarding. That's going out there in the falls that I'm talking about, the putting in the the hours and hours of pain and just battling tricks and being willing to get back up and go for it and still have that love for it. So so that's so if if if, if you heard that, what he's saying is that the way that the actual culture of skateboarding looks at success and looks at someone who's actually standing in their truth and is quote unquote, not a sellout is someone who's putting themselves on the line and is getting up there every day as much as possible and doing new crazy shit and going big. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's how this whole, you know, social media thing, the advent of Instagram, the advent of all these platforms have really created that movement, right? So yeah. people can see it now. Because I remember when I was a kid, the way I saw skateboarding was opening up a Thrasher magazine or some shit like that. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? This is completely different now. YouTube and all these things. It is, yeah. And so every time I call Nyjah, 
And every time we, you know, we're, we're talking about shit, it's always like, okay, in about an hour or two hours, I'm going to start skating. I'm going to go find some spot somewhere, whether I'm going to the Bay Area or going yeah, somewhere and then, in LA. And I'll send you some crazy falls. Later crazy that falls. <laughs> I get uncomfortable, you know, because I'm one of those guys that like seeing people eat shit. It's like, uh, it's uncomfortable for me because I, I know what those injuries feel like. But um, so, so you are going to continue to do this, right? This is your rite of passage. Of course. This is yeah. your loyalty to a sport that's given you so much back. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is a good segue. Now you and I have been talking about this for a while. I've been experiencing this my entire life. I think it's my good looks and my <laughs> charm. And no, I, I'm just kidding. Really what it is, is our passion. A lot of people are intimidated by passion. They're intimidated by people that embody their truth that are in their full masculinity. And I don't mean ego masculinity. I'm talking about knowing they're, that they're here, they're a force in this world. And someone who also likes beautiful things in life, right? Now there's yogis that are sitting in caves for a hundred years of their life and are free of all attachment of the material world, right? Which I find so beautiful and it's part of my training. It's part of my philosophy. I've done that for periods of times and I'll continue to do that for periods of times. Uh -huh. But I also like to visit five-star resorts and, you know, pamper myself with amazing treatments in life and eat yeah. the best food in the world and hang out with some of the most interesting people. Take, you know, l l live very, very comfortably in, a, in, in the abundance of energy that I've created, right? So it's finding harmony between both worlds. Yeah. Now, I've been hated on a lot, hated on because um, of what I stand for and my belief systems and how passionate I am. Now, I know you and I share that. You know, you and I share, we talk about this all the time. Envy, jealousy, we're just yeah. ruffling up someone else's insecurities. Tell me about what you're dealing with out there, what that experience is like, and a message to the people out there that hate you from afar that don't even know you. Man, I've dealt with it all. I've dealt with it all. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been dealing with that the majority of my career, and it's it's interesting because going back to the time where um, I wasn't with my dad anymore, I was being my own person. Got back into skating and found my love for it again and having fun skating with my friends. Around that time, like pe everyone was so hyped on me, hyped on seeing me win contests because they had seen me get so many second places, hyped on seeing me out street skating, having a good time because they saw me over the, so many years, like feeling like under my dad's wing. And then I started winning like 80% of contests, 80, 90%. So wow. if there was like three, if there was like three or four street leagues out of the year, actually some, some years there was even more, I would win like the majority of those. And people started hating. That's when it started. And so, then, so the consistency that you had, yeah, and because you started winning, that inferior complex started to come out, and it became kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, and, okay. And, and it was also what comes along with that. You know, I'm I'm 17, 18, 19 years old. If I'm out there winning a hundred grand for a contest, yeah, I'm gonna want to go out there and buy myself a nice car. You know, so it was also like owning owning a Lamborghini when I was. 19 years old they, they immediately they put you in a box and then they already it's like oh this guy is this guy's an asshole yeah you know he's he, he's all he's all ego yeah da, and, da, da, and da, then da. and then it transfers over into oh this guy's only skating for money this guy's not even having fun out here at the contest he's just skating for money when this is it's your like, fucking life this is everything you it's live like for. bro yeah. it's skateboarding yeah yeah it's skateboarding I, exactly i've been doing i've already been doing this for so long <laughs> you really think i'm all of a sudden out here skating for money yeah that's wild that's like clearly you don't know skateboarding in the first place because I, skateboarding is something that you only are performing that good and and skating that good and keep progressing if you have that love for it right Right. that's just how it goes yeah and your commitment and love for the sport of skateboarding and for the soul of skateboarding has to be at the highest level yeah. for you to be doing this and putting your life on the line. If you're hearing me, he's putting his life on the line every time he gets on that skateboard because he's not just riding around in a parking lot doing kickflips and heel flips. You're launching off some crazy shit that I would sometimes advise you against. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and just think about that. Okay, so so that energy has been going around. Where do you see that energy? It's like social media bullshit. 
Um, yeah, yeah. This was also around the time when social media was popping off, Instagram, Twitter, everything. So studio gangsters, right? Yeah, yeah. You get so, so many people behind a computer screen, behind a cell phone screen that can talk such a big game. I guarantee you, brother, 99% of them, they see you in real life. They'll yeah. come up to you and want to talk to you and get an autograph. Fake, fake. Yeah, it's so gnarly. And so if you're <laughs> listening to this... <clears throat> and you are this person or you have some of this frequency within you or you know someone that has this vibration, let them listen to this because you getting hated on or people talking shit or whatever, talking shit about me or whatever, it doesn't affect us. It really doesn't. It affects them. Yeah. It puts them in that state of mind. When you're in that state of mind, you're in something called poverty conscious, which is a scarcity mentality. It's a lack. When you're living in lack, you're never going to be able to create abundance and happiness and energy. Mm. It's it, This has been researched, studied, and proven in such deep levels of psychology. You know, We have toroidal energy fields coming off our body. We emanate a frequency. This body is electrical. We know yeah. that. If you're living in fear, pain, frustration, you have a scarcity or lack, that vibration, that electrical field is going to dimmer. It's going to come down. And you'll only be attracting the same people that are on that type of, type of frequency. Yeah. Here, here's something I want to touch on, too, is like I don't want people out there to think that I want everyone to like me. I don't need everyone to like me. I like being different. And I know like the matter if it's the cars I drive compared to other skaters out there that don't want to show that they like fancy things or the way I dress or anything like that. I've gotten hated on all these things over the years and I like being my own person. So I don't need everyone out there to like me and that's cool with me. But the people who are actually like, oh, fuck this kid because of this, or he only skates for money, he's whack, or the people that are literally at a contest booing me and like flipping me off before I try my last trick. It's just like, bro, like, yeah. really? Like, yep. don't like skateboarding, if anything, is the last thing that you should be acting that way in because aren't we supposed to like be together as skateboarders? Isn't it supposed to be like a Support community each of, other. Us, yeah. of us all loving and having passion for this thing that we do? Yep. And plus skateboarding isn't even like, I mean, yeah, I make decent money for myself, but I'm not out there like I'm not out there like these other athletes and people that like make millions and millions of dollars all the time, you know, yeah. like it's it's not even like that. And I'm. I'm I'm a pretty simple person, you know? Yes, I like nice things sometimes, but when it comes down to it, I'm a simple guy. I sit down on a sidewalk and eat a burrito in the gutter and watch my homie skate. You know, I'm not out there like living some extravagant lifestyle, like trying to be all bougie all the time. That's not even me as a person. So it's just funny when people come at me like that and I'm just like, bro, you guys are you guys are tripping. You have no idea. <laughs> I, I I respect you for saying that and I can confirm that everyone he's he's kind of like a Laguna Beach bum. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he rolls into my house with his shorts and T-shirt. He really doesn't give a shit about anything in terms of <laughs> fancy this or fancy that. He's still, you know, it's not it's not like that. He doesn't carry that vibe. If he had that vibe, you guys know me because you're listening to this. I would not have zero connection with him. I know so many materialists that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, billionaires that are always trying to connect. I want nothing to do with it because I can't be around that type of vibration. He has a quasi alternative health, holistic feel to him. And I love, I love what you said about you're not trying to be something for someone. You're just trying to be you. You're yeah. in your own embodiment. And that's, that's the same way that I operate. I mm. love being unique. I love actually being edgy. I mm. think that's part of my persona. And I see that in you as well. And I also want to ask you, have you embodied a little bit of a villain role? Do you know what I'm <laughs> De saying? Definitely. Remember LeBron went yeah. to Miami yeah. And he kind of became a villain. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or whenever Kobe Bryant would play in, you know, other other teams arenas, he was the villain. Yeah. I always would get off on that. You know, I love shutting the crowd up. I love being kind of oh, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. This this one instance that I was talking about when people were booing me in the crowd, it was, I think it was 2014 Street League Championships in New Jersey. East Coast are kind of in there there it's a very different skate scene over there so it makes sense that that was the place that a lot of people were booing me at and also i was skating against uh the homie ashad and that's his hometown new jersey philly so 
I uh, I understood it for that reason, but there was like a big section of the crowd, like really like booing me hard on this last trick. And they were just trying to distract me and shit. And I just like looked over at them. And I think I just gave them like a, or like a piece or something, threw down, landed the trick, won the contest. Bam. So I, when I look back at hating and everything that I've gone through over the years and that aspect of things, I look back at that moment and I'm like, I let, I let that shit hype me up. Absolutely. And that I, that I, fills I, your fire. I, ch I channel that energy and turn it into hype. And I literally threw down, landed the trick. And that was, that was it. So that's the best ever. I mean, that literally, we, we all love that kind of story. I love the energy of feeding off hate and turning it into your own powerful alchemy. And that's exactly what you did right there. That's so epic. I got to see that video. Yeah. And um, if you're listening to this, and you're you're feeling into this start looking at your own self start looking at your lifestyle start looking at people around you start looking at your friends start looking at your family your sphere of influence and start recognizing those types of energies now it's different he's doing this in competition he doesn't know most of these people but if you're around this type of hate 24 7 you have to make a commitment to yourself and start pushing those energies out so let me ask you did you have you know a lot of friends that you don't have you're not friends with anymore or i mean have you have you cycled through people that just weren't on the vibe that didn't stay true to themselves how, how do you how have you managed your friendships over the years how have i managed my friendships yeah because I mean, it's right, so, so critical so, i always tell you this i, feel, I say Nigel, the most important thing you can do is to make sure you have good people around you yeah. from there then we can start working on all the other things. absolutely yeah so i feel like i've done a good job at separating my real close OG homies compared to the like going out LA party party <laughs> homies. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and I feel like that's that's a good it's a good balance. It's a good way to separate. And I'm not saying that those people aren't my friends at all. I'm not saying that. But my my true circle are the, hom the homies that you've met. Yeah. Uh, Deloy. Yep. Damo. Yep. Sinner. Like yep. the 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 original boys that like those were really my first friends ever because I didn't have I wasn't allowed to have friends when I was a kid. Yeah. So when I was uh, when I moved down to SoCal when I was like 16, that that was my group. We went out and skating all the time, and we're we're still super close to this day. So you, you so you have your tight brotherhood, your tribe, and then you kind of have the scene people that, yeah. are, that you're totally cool with. Which, um, which obviously I've came around so much because over like, oh, just, just over the, the past few years or like, yeah, I guess like five, six year now, years now, like all the house parties I've thrown <laughs> at, at my, my old, my old house. San Juan Capistrano, everyone. Yeah, There's a ghost shout of Nija <laughs> floating around the neighborhoods of San Juan. You could just oh see his God. body <laughs> floating like Casper, the friendly Nija. Uh, he, he, he basically, you know, put that whole neighborhood into you know the whole city yeah, level of hell shout out san juan capistrano <laughs> I, I came in there and i really terrorized the place and i actually oh, man. i actually feel bad about it because i was young i was 19 i owned this big ass house and i was being a little shit <laughs> yeah. i was i was throwing big house parties all the time and the whole place, i would have killed the you whole police department obviously the neighbors <laughs> everyone was so over me bro like we were on the news. We we're literally there's photos on the news. Like this kid won't stop partying. Oh my god, that is he's like that's legendary stuff. We should probably create a statue of you. Yeah, we should. I told I told Nigel the other day that I was thinking about getting a house in San Juan, and he just gave me the funniest look. It was just the best ever. Um, uh, okay, so you've you've you know we continue to evolve. How old are you right now? You're 27. 26. You're 26. Okay, so you're 26. You're right at the ripe age, right in the middle of your career, right in your prime. You're going to continue to evolve every day. And that's something that you need to be aware of. I always tell you, like, you know, what you are today is not what you're going to be tomorrow. And every day you get better and better and cleaner and cleaner in terms of your approach and preparation, practice, commitment, all of that, all of those things. And you're really at a position now where things are really starting to raise up. So we're in this whole COVID situation. We were supposed to have the Olympics last year. Okay. And I think fate brought COVID. So you can meet me <laughs> and I can be in your corner throughout this process. I have a, a way of be true. being around world number one athletes and then them starting to win all the grand slams. It's just kind of something <laughs> that I do. Um, so Olympics is coming. It's in Tokyo. Okay. What the hell is going on? Where is your preparation? Where is your mind? Um, I have some ideas behind that that we, I really want to start implementing but how are you approaching this? This is a this is a whole nother league. This is a whole nother, different ball game. Yeah, it's interesting, man. I was like, first year ever for the skateboarding being in the Olympics, so it's obviously like a big thing. Obviously, it's a lot more 
pressure that I'm going to be feeling from on myself and from other people to go out there and perform well. Um, starting the beginning of last year before COVID, that was the start of me hyping myself up for it. I was like, all right, this is the year, first year skating Olympics. I'm going to, I'm going to be the most healthy and the most ready I've ever been. I'm going to practice all my tricks because when it comes down to it, I don't really like practice that often. I skate very often, but the actual tricks that I'm doing in those contests, I'm not practicing those all the time. On Wh the why is that? Because if you practice them too often, they're really like hard, gnarly tricks. So you don't really even want to do them all the time because it's a high chance of get, injury prone, high chance of getting hurt. Okay. And also most of the time I'm out there trying to be productive and go out there and street skate and film and film sick, sick tricks for video parts that people are going to be hyped on. I'm not just trying to sit in my skate park and do the same trick every day. Got it. And that's just a natural thing as a skateboarder. Sure. You want to go out there and challenge yourself. You don't want to go sit there and do the same trick every day. Yeah. Um, then COVID hit. And last year, I really made the most of what I could with the year, being productive. I filmed enough footage last year for probably two full video parts. If people don't know what a video part is with skating, um, it can take a year, two years to film. Um, you're basically gathering up um, around like 50 to 60 tricks, ideally. And those are hard tricks that you have never done before that other people have never done on the spot that you're doing it on. So it's just the the way to showcase your skateboarding and your creativity and you you as an actual skateboarder instead of going out there and just skating a contest. It's like your it's like your your trademark. It's exactly. Like your, yeah. po your poetry. It's, it's really what you're known for as a skateboarder. Amazing. I or love at least that. what you want to be known for. You okay. don't want you don't want to be known as a contest skater. No. You want to be known as a street skateboarder. Do you look at the Olympics <clears throat> as a contest? Can you can you decompartmentalize that a little bit like i think that's part of our psychology and how we can get into this because i i talked to other athletes about this and not really looking at it as a competition but looking at it more as a flow state yeah right it's it's yes they're going to be judging yes mm -hmm. there's gold medal silver medal bronze all that kind of stuff right but like when you get out there you know maybe you can just have a different emotion level and yeah it's just it just becomes just like you're street skating again yeah yeah right and that's what i've tried to do over the years ever since i started skating with headphones in in contests it's helped it's helped me you kind of tune out it's helped me channel those nerves and pressure because not even just from pressure from other people because i shouldn't even be feeling that as much anymore because when it comes down to it i have been winning out there winning contests for over a decade now so most of the pressure i put on myself Cause I'm hard on myself. I don't want to want to go out there and get second place. I want to go out there and win all the time. And that's just me. Um, but since I've started listening to music while skating, it's helped me kind of channel that into like a hype energy instead and get in the zone. I listen to a lot of house music yep. up when I skate and when I'm, when I'm skating a contest or when I'm uh, practicing at my park or whatever, I'll put on like an half an hour, hour long mix and I'll just get in the zone Yep. and just really try to be out there and just, get hyped up to go out there and give the crowd a show and land these tricks instead of being like, Oh shit. Like I'm, I, I need to win. Like I'm so nervous. Like my legs are shaking. Are you actually listening to music during the competition? Yes. So that's, so they allow that. Yes. Oh, that's epic. And the Olympics is going to allow that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's interesting. So you guys know how big music is for me. Actually, on this podcast, we're going to be sampling in one of my favorite groups, which is Carbon Based Life Forms. They play some of the, they, they've designed some of the trippiest music of all time. It's kind of psychedelic. For me, music is everything. Mm -hmm. It's such an interpretation to the one's soul. The audiophile, the cymatics, the vibratory field of music really generates a whole nother, you know, uh, consciousness and state of mind yeah and with house music in particular and certain kinds of house mu musics you can actually find a flow state in the music and it can drown out all over th other thoughts and i mm -hmm. think that's what you're doing that's fascinating yeah so olympics tokyo what's how many competitions are you in what does that look like this year there's not much planned so far i honestly don't even know what's going on as far as the qualifying goes um i'm still ranked number one in world for the points, the qualifying points for the Olympics right now. And all those points are the ones that we gained throughout the 2019 season. And from what I was told, we hold on to those points. So I'm assuming there's got to be at least a couple contests leading up to it this year, but I'm in a good spot to be there representing the U S. So as long as, as long as I'm there, I'm hyped. Are there other U S skaters? Yeah, there'll, there'll be three people from the big, big countries. So three from U S probably three from Japan, three from Brazil, um, the big countries in Europe. 
um, Australia, and yeah. Who's going with you that, with the, in the U.S.? Um, it's it's not for sure yet. Okay. Uh, the, other, the other people, I'm I'm pretty far ahead. Points is it a wise. point system? Yeah, Got it's a point, it. system point system compared Got to it. the other U.S. guys. So if there is a other a couple of other contests leading up to it this year, they're gonna, the other guys are gonna gonna be battling it out for those second and third spots. Okay, well, I'm I'm putting everyone on the spot right now. I'll be in Japan with <laughs> with <laughs> Naja. We're gonna be going crazy. I can't wait to be there. Yeah, we need you there. I'm I'm there a hundred million percent. Tokyo has been calling me. Japan's been calling me. The culture there. It's something that I really connect with. The, the way of the samurai and just their whole philosophy there. And plus, we make the best matcha ever. Matcha is coming from Japan, and that's a whole another subject. And I'm also quarter Japanese, so and, I'm, I'm I'm hyped that it's there. Yeah. So I was I was just gonna say that. So this is almost a return to your heritage. Yeah. Right. And and. The Japanese bloodline is a powerful bloodline. Uh -huh. You know it, right? I do you, know it. You own it, right? Yeah. I also you know, know it because these damn other little Japanese kids have been coming up so good at skating now. I saw it's that. I've been seeing too. them. There wasn't, there really wasn't any big, like really good Japanese skaters, especially as far as contests went. Yeah. Up until like three years ago. Did you start did, that? Was that, did do you feel like you're well, kind well, of, I mean, I'm, I'm quarter Japanese. I'm, I know. I'm talking about like kids that are like actually like. Full Japanese. I know, but Japanese. like, have you motivated, does Japan know who you are? I De guess that's definitely, my question. Definitely. I think, I think okay. I'm pretty big in Asia in general because when it comes down to it, most of the big skateboarders are just Americans yeah. or not, not really Asian. So. Right, right. Yeah. So they so they know that they they have probably pride with you. Yeah. World number one, kicking ass. He's got our bloodline in him. So yeah, there's there's a couple of Japanese kids, little guys that are doing some crazy Dude. shit. I couldn't believe what I saw. So what's I, your what's I, your take? I on heard that? I heard they got some crazy like training camps over there. Or something, <laughs> bro. I'm not even kidding. Like the dude. Russians, like I swear, like, they're cause just... the, the, all these kids just came out of nowhere and they're so good and they're they're good in different ways. They're technical, ways. right? They're technical. They're so precise. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they skate exactly how you would think a Japanese person would. Oh, interesting. Because I feel like it's the same way they go about their everyday lifestyle yep. and just their mindset. They're so like consistent and so precise which, with the way they do things. Like you see them do a trick like 10 times and it literally looks the same way every time. Uh, unbelievable. It's crazy. What, what I've noticed with some of my Japanese friends and just that heritage is that they have a really high level of presence, right? They're just present they're not drifting off into other things and yeah. thinking about other things and that's really gonna you know show in competition very, right? focused. very, very focused very focused yeah. absolutely yeah okay so i wish you the best luck on that we'll probably talk po possibly one more time on a podcast before that what's the date on the olympics i believe i'm going to be skating somewhere around like july 22nd 23rd i think okay. it starts on like the 19th and then it goes for that like next week or two um, so we have about six months. Yeah. Six months away. Mm -hmm. 180 days. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know what? I'm nervous that there's not going to be fans there. Yeah. Which there probably isn't going to be. That's part of your hype, right? That's yeah. part of, you know, an energy, right? Mm -hmm. And do you feel more nervous because it's not going to give you an advantage that you that you have because you think other skaters you know, sometimes fold under pressure. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I was thinking, I was kind of getting into your, yeah. into how your mind's working. So that's interesting, right? Yeah. I think you just surrender that. I just don't even think about it. Yeah. Don't even, that's not even part. You're just there to show up and do what you do best. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's just such a bummer though. Like, damn, yeah. just to be finally skating the Olympics and they're not being like everyone there, like watching you and just like hyping you up and stuff, you know? Yeah. Just it's the just energy. Like, it's, it's just weird. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious to see how it's going to be. Watching NBA games, you know, it's the start of it last year after um, the whole COVID debacle. That was weird seeing yeah. them play with like four people and just their bench. But I feel, yeah. but I feel like for them it could be easier. It, be, it's be, less pressure for them because for sure. the away games. Yeah, they don't have everyone yelling in their face and stuff. Yeah, see for skating, most for mo for most part, everyone in the crowd is like hyping everyone up. Yes, there's going to be some people that are hating, but like at least ninety percent of the people there, they just want to see people land gnarly shit yep so no matter who it is even if it's a skater that they don't know that and they see them land something gnarly they're going to be going crazy and cheering and that's like the beautiful thing about it okay so what happens physiologically when you get hyped up let's break that down so 
uh, you, you know, and I felt it when I give live lectures or when I'm talking in front of a hundred people, 200 people, 10,000 people, doesn't matter. I feel that adrenaline kick in Yeah. when that adrenaline kicks in all of a sudden, my brain receptors, my neuroreceptors, all of those things start to open up. My heart opens up and I'm lifted. Yeah. Then I get into a flow state. Then I'm super stoked. I'm animated. I'm energetic. Nothing can stop me. Right. Yeah. So we just, if that's the case, if there's not going to be a crowd, I think one of the main things we can do for training, besides all the nutrition, all the rehabilitation, all the technologies, all of that stuff, which is paramount is to get into a mind state where we can get hyped up without that crowd. Cause it's yeah. just biochemicals yeah. that really is what it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's a practice. That's a discipline that we can get to. This mm -hmm. is going to be fascinating. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And like I was saying with the music, the music really yeah. helps. The music just, will help. Just keeping myself hyped out there. And, uh, if you, you, you haven't really seen me, you've never seen me skate a contest yet. In no, person. not yet. But when you see me out there, I'm all, I just like, I'm high energy. So you're dancing around, yeah, I'm laughing, just like, going yeah, preserve. I'm just like jumping around everywhere, just trying to stay hyped. Yep. I feel like that's the best way to get through that pressure. It, it probably is because it is a very technical sport. Yeah. Again, you can't just miss a jump shot and then come back and make another yeah. one. It's different than that. Yeah. You know? so, something I want to touch on too is like, I feel like after me winning so much over the years, people have thought it's easy for me a lot of the times or like I win by a lot. But if you really look at it and you know skateboarding, you're watching what's going on. That's not the case. Almost every contest I've won, I'm winning by a little bit. I'm not winning by like a, a whole trick or a whole turn. Like I'm, I have to land that like second last or last attempt to win the contest. And when it comes down to it, any of the guys out there in the finals have a good chance of winning and they have the tricks it takes to win. So it really just comes down to who can handle that pressure on the big stage and who can land these tricks that they're actually used to doing, but just land them like in that moment. Wow, that was super beautiful. I felt that and I resonate completely with what you just said. That probably is the most profound thing that you said that everyone can hear. You know, a lot of people's people just assume things become easy for people. Mm -hmm. So not only is it almost a crapshoot to a certain degree, but you got to continue to work your ass off. Yeah. Right. And, and it's just part of the human psyche to just start expecting things from people mm -hmm. you know they start dominating something or there's something really good they just think that maybe they're born with it or maybe this and that no yeah. this is epigenetics this is above the genetic profile this means environmental factors how you treat your body how you take care of yourself what your mindset is how you're practicing all of those things and I, I, I really like I that was the best thing that you said the yeah. entire day, because that's what really people can take from that and not just assume and not just like that, that's not how it works with this. We're still living in some type of material world and we have to step forward and take the action. OK, so I want to start heading out towards our closeout. You and I uh, chatted a little bit about about a few things. I know that you are filming a documentary right now. I am, yes. Tell me a little bit about this documentary. Yeah, Ty Evans is filming it. You met Ty. He's Ty the, is the he's, best. He's the one that came to the, the racetrack? Man. Yes, he's I the like man. that guy. He's so tight. Yeah. Uh, we've been working on this documentary for the past two years now, and it was supposed to come out last year um, after the Olympics happened, but now it got pushed back a year, and it's actually a good thing it happened. It's given us more time to really get it right, more time to film stuff, and it's going to be... Obviously, I've had a ton of videos out there in the past. They're mainly revolved around skating. This is going to be really telling my whole story about where I came from, how I was raised, and what got me to where I am today. And also my journey with going to the Olympics for the first time and how how big that is as a skateboarder. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a cool thing, and I feel like it's really going to be cool to just showcase people who I actually am as a person, and more than just going out there and doing hard tricks. I think that's really important for you, for your for your soul, for your family and for your tribe. Yeah. The more people start to know who you truly are on the, you know, as far as like your character, the more they're going to be able to relate with you. Yeah. Right now you're like a fictitious character for a lot of kids. Uh-huh. You know, this is this guy is dominating the sport. He does the craziest, most hectic shit. He's having the best life ever. He's freaking tatted head to toe. You know what I mean? It's like they, they you you become a stigma. Yeah. Right. And but you're just human. Absolutely. Yeah. Your yeah. your embodiment is that of someone who's flowing through life and has ups and downs just like everybody else. You know what I mean? And for people to really understand that, 
I think that's one of the, the, the best educations they can have on life yeah. and show you like what's actually possible and to not to just create fantasy and illusion. So that's that's amazing. I can't wait to watch that documentary. Yeah. I wonder if our, our racetrack day was on, is going to be in that documentary. It should be. <laughs> there, there'll, there'll be some clips in there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So to, to, to kind of leave off, I mean, this was our first first podcast for Wake the Fake Up, which has kind of lived up to its name. Yeah. You know, we really hit on some points. That, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I, I love, you know, I'm usually the one that's getting interviewed. So this is different for me, but I'm always end up leading the conversation. Um, it's just kind of my uh, my ability to flow and transition into different things. I, I want to thank you for being on the show. I, I really am looking forward to taking things to the next level. But one of the main things I always talk about with Nija is like, do you think that you're just trying to maintain your career right now? Or are you trying to go to the next level? And my perspective is, is that there is so much more room to grow mm -hmm. in terms of his ability and his term to expand. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like even just as far as health goes and just me, me starting to take the products recently and stuff. I mean, I've already, I've already noticed a big difference just with that, just as far as like feeling more healthy. I, I've been getting him on some of our formulations at Symbiotica over the last I'd say six, six months, seven months, we're starting to up, up it up even more. And just think about it, someone who's never had that level of nutrition, because technically our food is shot today. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it's a green salad or anything like that. Everything's demineralized. And someone who's so on the game in terms of sports and doing such crazy competition stuff and every day putting his body through stuff, you, he would be the the actual you know perfect showcase on how these formulas work and what they do for them. So I have him on pretty much everything. He's at my house like once a week, stopping up and refilling. <laughs> and it's, it's actually pretty funny the way we, we got it going. Um, but I'm excited because I recently brought him down to our flagship office down in La Jolla. I introduced him to the entire team and we got some amazing things coming. We're working through how we want to develop it, but everything with me and everything with him has to be fully authentic. And that's, you know, where we stand in our truth. When we're not authentic, we know it and our value and our energy starts to diminish and it limits us in our production and our, the, the way we're going to show up for other people. Yep. And so I'm, I'm really hyped on how far we can take this. My whole thing is I'm here to change the world. There's no way around that. Um, I'm all in on every aspect and it's an honor to have you brother next to me by my side doing what you do best. And I'm here to support you in every decision and every life experience you have. So thank you. Thank yes. you so much for thank being you, on brother. Wake the Fake Up. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Hell yeah, my man. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> best ever. Gratitude family for tuning in today and deep reverence to you all for dedicating your time to seeking knowledge and truth. This is what it's all about. You can find more of my podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and Google Podcasts. You can also find this on my website at wakethefakeup.com. Life is all about momentum. Please leave a review so I can hear your experiences and share with your friends, family, and anyone who needs to hear this message. This is a revolution of consciousness. This is just the beginning. I am all in. I'll be back next week for another epic conversation. Stay tuned, family. Big love.